God, what's going on? So good to see you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me is a question. <laughs> now I can hear you. All right. How perfect. are you? I, uh, you know, I'm always excellent. Well, oh, I know you are. I woke up this morning, you know, I, I'm alive. So it, I'm, I'm excellent. <laughs> I love how you put it. You woke up this morning, you're alive. I think it's perfect. That's it. Somebody, hey, somebody didn't wake up this morning. Tell me about it, JT. Tell me about it. Um, okay. Hold on. I am. Ah, oh, sorry, JT. Oh, you're fine. I'm looking for the gallery view. No, um, you're you're fine. We we all love technology until it doesn't work. <sighs> Tell me about it. <laughs> it is so true. Well, thank you so much. So you know you're being recorded. Hopefully it's all okay with you. Of course. All right. Well, JT, I've been so excited and looking forward to seeing you, as you know. Um, because I've got a lot on my mind these days, you know, oh. good and bad. Good and bad. <laughs> And oh. I know that, you know, you're the guy who can help me out of it. It's just, um, how do I put it? Uh, you know, I, I go between completely like excited and we're going to, we're going to help everyone. We're going to change everything. And the next second I'm like, oh my God, I think we're doomed. How are we going to fix all of this? And, um, you know, so, so how about we just jump right in because I've been waiting for this moment. Make, make it happen. Let's do it. All right, JT. Well, first, I would love for you to be able to share your story um, with people. I, I know the JT McCormick story, but people have to hear it from you. It's just not the same. And it is the most amazing story. So can you tell us? Tell I, us? I will. Matter of fact, I'm going to share something with you real, real, real quick. So th this is this is really going to take us down a path. So you 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 met me. We, we met years ago and you met me as JT McCormick. Yeah. Well, if you notice on the screen there, it says Javon McCormick. Yes. And so what, what ended up happening, and I'm going to give you the backstory to this. Okay. <clears throat> back in my early 20s, so I'm, I'm 49 now, but back in my early 20s, mm -hmm. uh, I started going by JT. And, and the reason being was when I was first trying to start my career and, and land on people's calendars and schedule appointments, I could not get on a person's calendar. Mm -hmm. And no one would take my call. No one would give me an appointment. So finally, one guy actually took my call and he starts the conversation and says this, hey, how did you get a black first name and an Irish last name? And what, what was funny, my God, is, is I at the time, I didn't know my last name was Irish. So I was like, oh, wow, my last name's Irish. You know, I learned something. But then when I, I hung up the call, I realized, oh, that's why I'm not getting on people's calendars. So my actual name is Javon Thomas McCormick. So I started going by JT. Interesting. And I'll be damned if the next week I didn't start getting on people's calendars, started getting appointments. So I went by JT all the way up until last May, June, when the, the George Floyd murder happened and the protest happened and all that good stuff. And I decided to make the, the switch to Javon. And, and here's why. I, I'm watching the, the news. I'm paying attention to everything that's going on. And I saw some of the most shallow status signaling crap that, that I had ever seen. I mean, Blackout Tuesday on social media. What, what was that doing to advance anyone? Like, so, so you blacked out your Twitter. whoop de damn do and, and then uh, we were arguing over a syrup bottle. Really? I mean, a syrup bottle, what, what, I know. what, what, what change is that doing to, to assist anyone? So then I, find, I, I saw this article and it said that there were only three black CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. And so I, I started looking into it and I saw, okay, it was Roger Ferguson, Marvin Ellison, and Kenneth Frazier. Now, I, I love all three of these guys because they made it to the highest level of, of business. Mm. But if you notice, three very ambiguous, ethnic-free names. Mm. And so what, what jumped out to me is I said to myself, wait a minute. Okay, there's no Javon up there. There's no Ravante. There's no Jamarcus, Laquanda. Ravante. Yeah, there's no, there's no Martavius. There, there's no Lucretia. And so I said to myself, you know what? Okay, I'm going to reclaim my name and I'm going to start going by Javon because I, I've made it to the CEO chair 
And, and it really wasn't about me. The reason why I did it is because I wanted all of those kids where, where I come from, who are named Ravante, Javon, Martavius, Laquanda, uh, to see, okay, uh, Javon made it to the CEO chair. And, and the goal for me is that one day uh, people can work next to a Javon or, or a Ravante and not just a JT. And so last May, June, I, I reclaimed my name and started going by Javon again. I'm super excited for you, Javon. So I am going to change my, my, your name in my head as well. And it's going to be Javon from here on. And I'm very, <laughs> I'm very excited. So Javon, tell us the story. You have so, crazy stories. The, the, the way that I got my black name is, is <laughs> so my, <laughs> my, my father was a black pimp and drug dealer back in the, the 1970s. He mm -hmm. Uh, in, in somewhere along the line, our, our society twisted the word uh, pimp and we, mm. we made it a, a positive, you know, pimp my ride, pimp my apartment. Now, yeah. my, my dad was a real life pimp. He put women on the street corner. They sold their bodies. My dad took every dollar. And uh, along the line, <laughs> he also managed to father 23 children. So my wow. dad, I'm one of 23. Now, my mother, my mother's wife, and she was raised in a 1950s institutional orphanage when and she had never been outside of those four walls. When she turned 17 years old, they gave her $20, a small suitcase, and they said, good luck to you. There's a world. And unfortunately for her, uh, one of the first people she met was my fast talking, well-dressed, quite a bit older uh, father. Yeah. And so... <clears throat> That's what I came into the world to, and, and I'll, I'll throw some details out there to you, and then we, we can dive into it if you want, but yes, please. Uh, ch childhood was rough. You know, I, I was raised on, on welfare by, by a single mom. We, we lived in public housing. Uh, being mixed race in the 70s was not a good look. Hell, sometimes it, now in, in 2021, it's not a good look, but it's- I was uh, going to say. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's changed, but not, not a lot, and, and so- uh, but, you know, I've never made an excuse about it. You know, I, one of the greatest lessons that, that I was ever given, um, my mother and I were standing in line for our food stamps one day, our, our free handout. This is back in the 70s where you had food stamps and it was welfare. There, were, there wasn't a debit card or anything. And so we're standing in line and this older white lady looks at me, looks at my mom, and then she spits in my mother's face and calls her a nigger lover. And, and what was interesting is no, no one came to my mother's assistance. She stood there humiliated. She had to wipe the sweat from or the, the oh. spit from her face. She was crying, but, but she had to stay there in line because she had to feed her mixed race son. But the lesson that came for me was mm -hmm. I realized in that moment, oh, everyone's not going to like you. You know, mm -hmm. black people aren't going to like you because you're half white. White people aren't going to like you because you're half black. Mm -hmm. And that was the moment at eight years old that I, I said to myself, okay, I, I'm not going to spend my life trying to make everyone like me because it's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's kind of the harsh reality that I grew up in, in the seventies. I was in and out of juvenile three different times as a kid. I was sexually molested by one of my dad's prostitutes at the ages of six, seven, eight years old. Uh, I, Never graduated high school. I have a GED and I have no college degree, but here I am now. I can barely spell. I can't tell you an adverb from an adjective, but I'm the CEO of a publishing company. God bless America. <laughs> say, say that again. Say that again. God, God bless America. I've been Thank the pre you. president of a uh, software company that, you know, I was the lowest paid person in this company. I used to make my calls on a fold-out metal chair, and I, in two and a half years, I went from the lowest paid sales guy making my, my calls in the storage closet, and I went, to the pre went and became the president of the company, and we scaled that company with offices in Austin, Dallas, Houston, Monterey, Mexico, and I still make the joke. I go, I, I don't write code, but I was the president of a software company, and now I'm the public, uh, CEO of a publishing company, and can't spell. I mean, God, God bless the person who came up with spell check because they, they have been so great in my career. <laughs> I feel that way every day. Trust me, as a non, uh, as a non uh, native English speaker, I feel that way every single day that God makes. But you know, JT, you said something uh, and both you and I were laughing when you said, God bless America. Can you, can you go deeper in that? 
why God bless America in your particular situation? Um, you know, it, it's, I, I, oh, man, I so appreciate that. That's one of the best questions I've ever been. I've done a lot of podcasts and that's mm-hmm. one of the best questions I've been asked. And, and here's why. Mm-hmm. A lot of people will say to me, oh, well, you know what, Javon, I, I don't have your background. I don't come from where you come from to, to dig deep for that inspiration. And, and I, I say to people, when, when I look for inf- inspiration or belief, that I can make it through a situation. I don't actually dig back to my own past. I have to look no further than what's going on in in society right now. And so here's one that I dig to. For every time that I was sexually molested by by my dad's uh, prostitute, for the times that I was in juvenile prison and no one knew where where I was, uh, for every all the times that I dug out of trash cans to, to eat uh, because I wasn't going to get my free lunch again until till Monday. For all those times, I've never, never had to face being a single parent or a single mom walking 1,100 miles from Honduras with their two kids standing at the border of Texas trying to get into this country just to create an opportunity for themselves. And, and here's what's crazy, my God, is even if you make it into the country, here's what you get. Great, you got in. You still have to find a job, shelter, food, money, and you don't speak the language. And so my attitude is, wait a minute, on my worst day of being sexually molested, I never had to face those type of challenges. So for me, I feel that I have a deep responsibility to be successful, achieve my dreams and goals. Because at, at the end of it all, I at least was born here. Yeah. You know, as, a, as an immigrant to this country myself, I can so relate to what you're saying because that's how I feel so often. You know, when I hear people complaining about this country, I tell them, you may, you, may, you may like or dislike it, but at the end of the day, uh, as a black person, I can tell you that this country is one of the, still one of the best you know, to, to, to manifest your, your potential. Um, it's not to say that there are no problems, but um, you know, when I compare this place to other countries that I, you know, that I have been living in, <laughs> we have a lot to be thankful for. So, oh, yeah. um, you know, Javon, tell us, um, I, I love, I love, what, you know, like how you got yourself from what you just talked to us about, you know, from the stage where you were being molested, then you went into ju- juvie, juvenile. Do they, we call it juvie sometimes, I think? You, you know, I, I call it what it is. Uh, my God, it's, it's juvenile prison. And, and it's funny, I, I feel like as a society, we call it juvenile detention because it sounds less harsh. But, mm. but I, I was a kid in juvenile prison. And I remember when I got put in solitary confinement, those two big guys put me in solitary confinement. It was dark and, and I was there and I no one knew where I was. And I didn't know if I was ever gonna get out. And you're sitting, you're a kid and you're, you're wondering, oh my God, what's gonna happen to me? So it, it's funny because people try to soften um, what society is. It's juvenile prison. Let's just mm-hmm. call it what it is. It's, it's not juvenile detention. No, it was harsh, it sucked. Wow. Wow. So then Javon, when you were in there, um, and you're going to have to remind, I would like for you to remind everyone how old you were in there. Do you feel like something happened for you then, you know, in your way of looking at the world? Or is it later that things happened? Because something happened that allowed you someone who had all the odds against him, if we listen to people, except maybe the odd of being born in the United States, someone who had all the, bo- all the uh, odds against him, managed to come from the background you came from to who you are today, sitting where you are sitting in today. When do you think that something happened that just changed the trajectory of your life or, or maybe a few things that happened? Yeah, there it is right there. It it was never one thing. I, I, I'm very happy that I've been able to look back at life and find the positives in negative situations because mm-hmm. they're, they're there. Sometimes you got to dig a little more and, and, and they're harder to find, but there's always a positive to be had. Mm-hmm. Um, now I, I'll share two stories with you. First, the, the one about juvenile, the, the best piece uh, of juvenile prison for me was after I had been in there three times, the last time I, I'm about to leave this correction officer's big, big dude. Uh, he gets down on one knee and he looks at me and he says, Hey, Come here, son. Let me tell you something. If you come back here again, 
you're going to man prison. Now, my God, I'm, I'm 49 years old, and I don't know what it is about the sound of man prison that doesn't sound right. <laughs> I, do not, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to go to man prison. And so, <laughs> it um, sounds terrible. Yeah, I'm like, oh, no, I, I'm, I'm good. I mean, it, there's something worse than this? No, I'm, 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 I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. And that gentleman literally is, is the reason why I never went back to, to juvenile. It, because wow. he said, if you're coming back here again, you're going to man prison. And I'm like, oh no, not going to man prison. And so that that was a lesson. Here, here was my first window into entrepreneurship. I mean, at nine years old, I didn't know what the hell entrepreneurship was. I mean, hell, at 30, I didn't know what entrepreneurship was. Uh, uh, I was nine years old and I was with my dad one weekend and we're out collecting money from prostitutes. And I remember we went to the, it, it was cold. It was in Dayton, Ohio. It was cold. I can still smell the heater when I tell this story. And, and we, my, my dad was in his 1979 uh, Eldorado Cadillac Barretts. It was candy apple red on the outside, candy apple leather, red leather seats on the inside. And the, and the, the carpet was red. And wow. so it, it was the, the black man's uh, car in, in the, in the 70s. So we pull up to the first prostitute and she hands in a stack of money and she says, hey, can I come in? And, and my dad in the most encouraging way, no, 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 get out, but get back out there. You're on a roll. You, hey, girl, I'm proud of you. You know, go, go out there. And uh, he said, I'll be, I'll be back in a few. She goes back and then we go to the next lady and she sticks her money in and her stack wasn't as big as the other ladies. And my <laughs> dad lost it. I mean, he started using every piece of foul language that he could come up with to degrade, humiliate the, this woman. Get your ass back there. You better have my, when I come back, if you don't have, I mean, just lost it. And you saw her, she started crying. He rolled up the window. We drove off. And I remember at nine, I'll, I'll never forget this. I remember saying to myself, huh, I wonder if I could make more money in volume, if I treated the prostitutes better and they got to keep part of the money. Hmm. And, and that was my first, like, okay, how do you put people first? How do you treat them better? And, and that was my first foray in, into um, how do you scale a, a company? And I even remember I took it next level. I, I said, well, wait a minute. I'm going to have a lot of, uh, pimps that are going to be mad at me. I started thinking about competition because their, their prostitutes are going to want to come and, and work with me. And so that was my first, oh, okay, how, how do you take a business and, and make it better? Now, some people don't like that example, but that was my example. It was your, exa it was your example. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so JT, uh, Javon, Javon, sorry, I, it's, it's, it's going to take okay. some time I, for me. I still call myself JT sometimes. <laughs> sorry about that, but I will be better. Uh, Javon, um, one of the reasons why I was super excited to speak to you, especially when I said, um, you know, some days, some days are with and some days are without. Um, you know, I oftentimes think of you because um, oftentimes I tell myself, um, Javon is out there and I know he's telling his story and I know that uh, so but thankfully you you will change some mindsets out there what I'm what I'm alluding to here is the whole shabang going on around critical race fury around anti-racism the anti-racism fury of uh Ibrahim Ibrahim X candy on one end and uh D'Angelo Robin D'Angelo on the other end and the fact that there are some serious policies being put in place right now, you know, as because when you take those theories seriously and you want to follow up with policies to reflect on it, you know, some very dangerous stuff starts to happen. Um, anywhere from the fact that, you know, mind you, we have an entire generation of uh, young black people in this country being, you know, um, raised to believe that no matter what, they are going to be oppressed and that no matter what, the white people are racist and that, um, you know, we have to dilute math because real math uh, is in a way being racist because 
oh, I guess it's because some people must think that black people can't do real math. So we have to do black math and dilute the whole thing. No, I mean, Siobhan, this is really, really scary. And so, like I said, sometimes I wake up feeling like we're going to get this. You know, we're, there's no way we're going to let an entire generation of children black, white, yellow, green, depending on their skin color, believing that they are the, the devil or that they're very eternal oppressed. It's very, I'm, 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 I'm so sad, I'm so angry, but often, you know, but every day I wake up and I'm like, we can do something about it. We're gonna do something about this. And then after a while you, re you read this one more news, that other news, and you're just like, we're doomed. We're doomed because yeah. it seems like it's going everywhere. So I was looking forward to speaking with you because I do know that someone like you, um, you can instill some wisdom in, in people. You know, we, we have to, I, I refuse to let this go. We can't, it's gonna, it's not gonna end well. No, it's, it's even right now, not, not only is it not going to end well, it, it hasn't begun well. And, <laughs> and, 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 and here, here's what's, what's interesting to me. And, and, and I'm going to touch on this because, because let's, let's all be honest with ourselves. Please. This became a big movement because of George Floyd and, and what went down, because we saw a, a black man being murdered on video. And so everyone lost their mind. So, so I'll, I'll give you some insight and I'll be fully transparent about our company. So obviously me being mixed race, everyone wanted to know as the CEO, okay, what, what are your thoughts? I'm going to share with you exactly what I shared with our company. I said, you know what? I'm frustrated. I'm pretty damn frustrated. And they were like, why? I said, because this isn't new. I go, yeah. be, because it was on video now, we're, we're, we're pissed off. Like, this is not new. The fact that you can say to me, oh my God, did you see the man that, that died saying I can't breathe? The fact that I got to say which one, that, that should tell you something. So, so it's not new, but what really frustrated me the most, Maga, is uh, I said, you know, I don't know if every, everyone was running around saying, oh, but it's different this time. It's different this time. And, and I said, I don't know that it is. And I said, Here, here's why. Because for the last two and a half, three months, we've all been sheltered in place. We're pissed off. We're angry. I said, 41 million Americans right now are unemployed. We're pissed off. We're angry. Yeah. So when this happened, it just gave us a reason to go out and be pissed off and angry. And I, I really... I expressed to people, I said, I don't know how true this is. Is this another, another Ferguson where for two and a half weeks, we're pissed off, we're angry, we burn some shit down, and then we, we move on, and then everyone forgot about it? Mm -hmm. I said, are we actually going to make change th this mm -hmm. time? Are we going to do something different? Mm -hmm. And so that, that really frustrated me. And I, I expressed to people, I said, look, I remember being kicked out of public housing because my mom had a, a mixed race son. I, re I remember having to change my name because people looked at I said, so all of this stuff now, it, it's, it's a bit comical to me that everyone wants to uh, show support. When I saw white people yelling at other white people who were sitting out in front of a, uh, a deli or whatever, uh, saying, if you don't stand with this, you're against this. I'm like, who, who are you actually marching for? Like, what, what is your, your, your movement? So, yeah, I, I agree with you that it's, it's very dangerous. The narrative that that's being creative created because yeah, I, I still very much believe in this, this country. Are there flaws? Yes. Is it completely fair? No. Will it ever be? No. Will there always be racism? Yes. And, and so for me, you, you know, this, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a man of faith. I'm not going to make this too, too godly, but I'm a man of faith. Here, here's the way I look at, at life. The commandment says, love thy neighbor as thyself. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say love thy neighbor if they're gay, love thy neighbor if they're not, love mm -hmm. thy neighbor if they're mixed race, love thy neighbor only if mm -hmm. they're not black. It, does, it says love thy neighbor as they love thyself. So mm -hmm. for me, if we just started there mm -hmm. of, you know what? I know you have an opinion. I have an opinion. I'll accept that you have some a different belief th than mine. Mm -hmm. But the way we're going about this in the country right now, uh, especially the 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 black movement of it, um, 
I, I completely dis disagree with it. The, the one that I can't stand that bothers me the most is when I'm watching Fortune 500 companies fill up their seats with chief diversity officers and you, so they can check a box and, and say, okay, we got this diversity thing covered. D diversity, there's no finish line. <laughs> I mean, like there's there's no finish line and I, we this is a, a something that has to be uh continued and we also here's here's what hurt me a lot when i heard a lot of black people saying it's not my job to 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 educate you it's not my yeah, and i'm like wait a minute we can't be pissed off as a people because they don't understand and then when they're trying to understand we're pissed off that they're trying to understand like you can't do both and so I'm like, look, if someone's seeking to learn and seeking to educate themselves, I have a responsibility to, to do that. And, and I don't mind doing so, especially if they're not being shallow or, or, or it's just some status signaling effort. But we can't be mad when people are trying to understand. If you don't come from the communities I come from, I don't expect you to understand what goes on there. I have to educate you on this is the world I grew up in. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think it's fair, then, uh, Javon, to say that um, <laughs> you don't think that uh, one can ever be strong by claiming victimhood. What Hell good, no. What oh, good God. <laughs> My God. You, okay. Oh, Sorry. you hit me with the, the victim. No, no. <laughs> oh, hell no. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, but so so I guess it's clear you um, and, and t tell us more, Javon, because again, you're so full of wisdom and the way you talk about it. I just love it. Why do you feel that there is no strength in victimhood? And and why do you think today in America so many black people are so willing to to jump on the on the victimhood bandwagon? Oh, I'm oppressed. Oh, we're oppressed. And if you don't want to say that you're oppressed, then oh, you're a sellout. You're you're not you're not a real black. <laughs> I'm well, so tired of this. It's not even a joke. So what, I want to tell you, do you want to know who's more black? My ancestors <laughs> were not. My ancestors were not sitting around, no matter what happened to them, feeling like bad for themselves. It's like we do something, you know. And I'm I'm talking here about even pre-colonial Africa, like really powerful, you know, just decided people. And we we fight. Something happens, we fight. Yeah. We, anyway, go no, ahead. No, I. I, I I have been called Uncle Tom. I have been called sellout. I have been called, um, you know, I've only succeeded because I'm light skin. Uh, I, I mean, you know, <sighs> here's here's a good Colorism. one. Colorism. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh. Well, because you have that good hair, and and so yeah, I I've heard it all. Hey, Javon, I've always yeah. felt like you had nice hair. You know, yeah. like nice curly hair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was I was always jealous of your curls, man. <laughs> my guy, I have heard it all, and it, it's funny. I've never been black enough and I've never been white enough. And, and that's how I explained it to people. I said, wait a minute, you, do you really wanna go down a, a, a race conversation? Because let me tell you what it's like when neither side likes you and you don't have anywhere to fit in. And, and I really, I, I look at it that way because it gives me the best of both worlds to be able to understand bo bo where both people are coming from. Here, here's my view on it. And I, I'll say this, I'll say it out loud. You know, there's a lot of conversation about um, uh, reparations. Oh, re oh. <laughs> I will say this, and this is this is my opinion. Other people don't have to feel this way, but if someone showed up to me and they tried to give me a, a reparations check for a hundred thousand dollars, I would literally shred the check. And then I would take $100,000 of my own money and find a, a, a charitable organization to, to donate it to. I, I don't want anyone to get, yes, it, we, we have a, an incredibly fractured past a, as a country. Yes, some horrific things w went, went on in, in this country. Um, I, I know we can walk and chew gum, but when I look around and, and I see what's still going on in this country, it, it's funny how how loud things got for Black Lives Matter. And but have have we like forgot about the natives who are still living on reservations who literally have it worse than anyone in this country, the, the education, the alcoholism, the everything, the natives. Now, don't get me wrong, we can walk and chew gum. We can do two things at once and address two two different cultures. I Correct. get that. But 
I choose to focus on what can I do to, to make change? What can I do to improve? I can't change the fact that my dad was a pimp. I can't change the fact that I was sexually molested. I can't change, change who, who I was born to. My God, to this day, I don't know where my last name comes from. My mom got wow. that last name when she was in the orphanage. She has no clue where or why. So I have a last name to this day, no clue where it comes from. Wow. Okay, great. But I don't use those things as excuses. Oh, look, look where I come from. And you said something earlier. So, oh, this, this is very important. You, you had mentioned... I had every reason to, to, you know, not succeed. And that's how many people have looked at me and they, oh my God, you had every reason not to succeed. Uh, people would have totally understood if you would have ended up in prison. I'm like, bullshit. I had every reason to succeed because if you can get through what I got through, interesting, you're supposed you're, to succeed. Oh, I love this, Javon. Thank you so much for correcting this part because I don't know if you knew, but, uh, you know, recently I started a show with uh, a gentleman called Bishop Omar, whom I love. And please join me in prayers for wishing him to continue doing well. He's recovering from, um, you know, from COVID. But, uh, you know, one, one thing for the longest time, Javon, I was one of these black people who was really mad at the hip hop and rapper uh, community for what I perceived to be their contribution to the state of urban black people in America. And the urban black people I'm talking about are the ones that are not doing so well. There are millions of black people doing just fine, thank you very much in this country and good for them. But I'm talking about the ones where, you know, we're hearing weekends, people being sh you know, shot at uh, within communities uh, in Chicago and South Central, like, you know, places like that. So I have always been upset at that, at, at the rappers and the hip hop people, because they felt they're the ones who sold this lifestyle, you know, the thug lifestyle, the drug and violence lifestyle. lifestyle. But then it down down on me at some point. I'm like, wait a second, we have to work with these people because in a way, they're actually our best hope for the community. Because mm -hmm. A, that's the, they are the only people that the youth in urban black culture lis listens to. Yep. Whether I want it or not, that's who, they, that's who they listen to. And second, I'm like, wait, each one of these people's lives is a wonder, is an amazing testimony. Tes testimony, you know, English, again, not my, for, not my <laughs> main language. So, you know, each one of their lives is just such a, 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 a proof that we can overcome. Because most of them have survived things that the rest of us probably could not have survived. And yet they still are here. And the ones we hear about are actually the successful ones, the ones yeah. who on top of that. And, you, you, and when you start talking to these poor people, you realize all of them, all the skill sets that they had to develop along the way, you realize beyond the bling, these people have perseverance, they have grit, they, yes. they're smart, they're intelligent. These are entrepreneurs like on steroids, if you think about it. So, so yes, eventually we started, we're like, okay, let's see if they can share that wisdom of their life with the youth that usually only sees the bling, but maybe here we get to take them behind the scene, who these people really are. And when you said, I mean, I've never, what you just said is so profound. I had no, can you say that again? Because I'm almost gonna put it in my wall. Everyone, this is such a common thread. Everyone will read my book, hear my story, watch a keynote and they're like, oh my God, Javon, you had every reason not to succeed. You had every reason to fail. Uh, you know, I totally would have understood if you would have ended up in, in prison. And, and it's always, it's like the number one thing that, that bothers me when people lead with that, because I go, no, no, no. I had every reason to succeed because the things that I learned and the things that I made it through, I, 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 was, I was supposed to succeed. Because if you can make it through those things, if you, if you think about it, cor corporate America is pretty damn easy at that point. You know, I mean, it's, it's uh, here, here's what's interesting. I appreciate you saying this. So, so I mentor uh, high-risk youth that are transitioning from juvenile prison to the halfway house back into society. Mm -hmm. And I, I've said to people so many times, the, if we're really looking to grow communities, uh, help lower economic communities, white, black, brown, and, and I, I say white as well, because people tend to forget that there's West Virginia, Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee, Mississippi. There's a lot of poor white people in this country, too. And, and it's sad. I, I, I won't go too far off. It's sad because if you say low income communities, and I've tested people with this, you say low income communities or welfare. Everybody thinks black, 
yeah. or brown. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And people don't know that you can take black people and brown people combined, and there's still more white people on welfare than there are black and brown combined. And, and But people don't think that. So here, here's my thing. You, you nailed it. The lessons that you learn within the lower economic communities and the things that some of these, these young uh, men and women have overcome, people really get mad about this example I'm going to give. And it, it is, it's harsh. Please. So a pharmaceutical rep gets paid to do what? Give out free samples. So here's the thing. Every drug dealer in America knows the first rule of the game, the drug game. The first sample is free. Why? Because I want you to get hooked so you come back and keep buying it. So what's a pharmaceutical rep's job in this world? They go around to doctor's offices and they give out free samples. Then the doctor gives out the free sample to the patient. The patient tries the free sample, decides they like it. Well, then the patient calls the doctor and says, hey, I'd like to get a prescription. Well, the doctor needs to make more money. So they say, hey, you got to come back into the office so I can get that office fee money for you visiting again for me to write this five-minute prescription. Then they call it into Walgreens for to get your prescription filled. So Walgreens has got to get their cut. Now, Walgreens then calls your insurance. You've got insurance. Okay, so now the insurance company gets a cut. Finally, the, the, the drug cartel, which is the large pharmaceutical companies, they get their cut. Now, let me give you the same scenario in the hood, the low economic communities. You've got the drug cartel that ships it into the country. You've got the local kingpin, whoever, whoever that is of the city. And then you've got the street dealers. Three levels, that's it. But in America, in, in our corporate culture, we turn this into everybody's got to get a piece. Everybody's got to get a, a taste of it. These kids, they're out there. Not only are they avoiding the police, they're figuring out how they can flip their product, how I can make more money. So the education that you learn in these lower economic communities, if you even heard me say, where, where did my lesson come from? Watching my dad have prostitutes. Mm. You go into corporate America with some of the lessons that you've learned, they're, they're priceless of the, wow. of the things that, that I understood. But unfortunately, you don't know what you don't know. So, Javon, is that what you do? Because I have a feeling that's exactly what you do. You're, 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 you're basically, the way I look at you is you are a translator of the lessons learned or the lessons that can be learned on the street or from the difficult circumstances, not only on the street, difficult and any difficult circumstances, you are someone who is there to say in this, here's the lesson and here's how to apply it to the other side, maybe yeah, it, it, the here, legal a, side or whatever. Here's an easy one, uh, dress code. So everyone in the hood knows you don't go into certain neighborhoods with a certain color on or a certain, you know, what that that's well known in, in every low economic community, gangs, whatever the case may be. We all know you don't go into certain neighborhoods with certain colors or certain outfits on. Okay, great. Corporate America. You don't go into certain boardrooms unless you've got on loafers, suit, tie, like there, there's dress code everywhere. So how do you teach that dress code? exist here and it also exists over here mm -hmm. and, and you know one, one of my favorites that that people have told me many times oh you're so articulate um oh I hate that one <laughs> I hate that one too uh like like I'm not supposed to be but I uh, really um, right? but I'm it, supposed to what? right it, it, but here's the thing when you explain it to the kids that are coming out of these low-income communities that yes, we, we have a, a language that we speak here, but there's also a language that you speak over here. It's not called, oh, you're talking white. No, it's called I'm being professional. That because in this world, you have to conduct yourself with some professionalism. It, 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 this, this, will, this will explain everything. So I was in the room, I was doing, I was a keynote and there were about 500 uh, CEOs in the room. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, or I said to the crowd, I said, okay, how many people in here can perform brain surgery? Any, any neuro uh, uh, doctor, neuro- uh, Neurosurgeon. Uh, yeah, Neurosurgeon. neurologist, there you go, uh, in, in the room. And uh, nobody raised, raised their hand, of course. I said, okay, how many people in here can build or launch a rocket in the aerospace engineers? No one raised their hand. I said, okay, see, we don't know what we don't know. 
I said, unfortunately, where I come from, there's just a lot of things we don't know. Mm -hmm. I said, it wasn't until I was 35 years old that I even knew what a barista was. And, and, and then I tell this story to, to people. My, my second job, uh, I was working, I was 18, 19 years old. I was working at an insurance company and I was the, the mail room. And, and this, this, this will tell you everything you need to know about you don't know what you don't know. I was working in the mail room and I was a filer and I'm pushing my cart and I'm going by this, this conference room and it said free lunch and learn 401k. And all I saw was free lunch. I'm like, I am there, free lunch, count me in. They, <laughs> my God, they could have been talking about uh, the female reproductive system. I'm, I am going. And <laughs> so I'm like, okay, free lunch. So I kept pushing my cart and this lady comes walking by. And now listen to what I say. I, I said, excuse me, ma'am, can you tell me where conference room 401k is? I didn't even know that 401k was an investment. Tool. Right, right, right. And, and so she, she laughed and she goes, no, 401k, that's what the conference is, is about. And I was like, oh, and so I went to, and still didn't know what it was, but I went to the, the, the 401k lunch and learn, free lunch and learn, got my free lunch. But I heard two of the greatest words in the history of mankind, compound interest. I learned how to take $100 and turn it into 200, two into five, five into 1,000. And the great majority of, of my personal net worth has been made in, in the stock market. And it all came from, I saw a sign that said free lunch and learn 401k. And I didn't even know what the hell a 401k was. So you see the lesson in that. I think, I, I hope it's not lost on anyone. It's definitely not lost on me. Um, so Javon, um, we're getting toward the end here, but. So how does one remain strong, especially in a world where it seems like there is a conspiracy out there and there's a consensus out there that everybody wants to make us Black people oppressed. We should feel sorry for ourselves and we should be steeping in victimhood. So how, um, how do you remain strong in, in, you know, how do you remain strong in general, just, you know, regardless of anything else, how do you remain strong? For, for me, I... I... I, I remain strong because, like I said, one, I always take a look at, at, at society. You know, I, I've never had to deal with cancer. I don't know anyone that's had cancer. I've never had cancer. But I always say to myself, you know, we, you and I started this call. Uh, and I, you asked me, hey, how are you doing? I said, I, I'm excellent. I woke up this morning. My feet hit the ground. And, and, and I truly mean that because somebody didn't wake up this morning. You know, there's, right. some, there's somebody in a hospital bed right now, right now. That's right. Who, who can't even walk to the restroom on their own. And, and right. I, I have the gift that I can get out of bed and go to the gym at four o'clock in the morning. So I, I choose life is a choice of, of how you want to view it. And, and so I'll, 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 I got two pieces here and, and I won't go too long. So I get this a lot. Well, what's the one thing? What well, is not one thing? I mean, there's a lot of things that, that I went through, but here is the things that, that I live by. First set, um, I eliminated three words from my vocabulary when I was a kid. And the, the words I eliminated were hope, wish, and luck. And, and people are like, what? And I said, okay, when I was a kid and I would hope my dad would come pick me up, he never showed. When I would hope there was something to eat when I got home, it never produced anything. So I stopped hoping and I, I replaced hope with belief because for me, if you believe something, you have to execute to, to bring that belief to life. And so, so we got, I, I got a friend of mine, he's a pastor and, and he says, Javon, he goes, man, I said hope in my sermon 16 times last Sunday. I can't stop saying hope. And I, and I said to him, I said, okay, do you want me to hope there's a God or do you want me to believe there's I a God? I loved it when you told, yes, yes. I yes. said, because if I just hope there's one, I don't really need to commit to this godly lifestyle. But if I believe there's a God, then I got to commit. And I said, belief forces execution. If I believe I can have the big house, then I got to do something to execute to get the big house. If I believe that I can get out of my circumstances, then I have to execute to get out of my circumstances. So I don't, I don't do hope in any way, shape, or form. And then wish, 
Oh God, that, that wish is just a disgusting word. And, and so, um, sorry, I, I, I've got four kids, uh, seven, five, three, and two. So we got a lot of birthdays to go down at the McCormick house. <laughs> when the, when the birthday cake hits the table, we don't say make a wish. We say make a goal because you can wish all day and it's not going to produce a damn thing. You can <laughs> wish you can have the big house, wish you can have the career, wish you can get out of your, keep wishing and watch what happens. Nothing. Nothing. So I don't wish. And then luck, I tell people all the time, well, then if, if there's such a thing as luck, there wasn't when I was a kid. So I don't believe in it. And so mm -hmm. hope, wish, and luck, I threw those out. Last piece of this, Magad. Um, the formula I created for myself in life. You asked me, how do I keep going? Mindset, choices, and hard work equals success. Mm. What's my mindset? Am I going to be a victim? Am I going to say, oh my God, you know, my, my dad was a pimp and, and I, I was uh, abused and, and I was sexually molested. Here's, here's what I have found over the years. I can sit there and think about that all day. I can lay in bed for a week and cover up. Doesn't change anything. I can't change that I was sexually molested, but I figured out, oh, wait a minute. I can change the next hour, day, week, month, and year. So I'm going to focus on what I can change. And I'm not going to focus on the things that I can't change. And so mindset, what, what's your mindset each day? When you wake up, is, is it a great day? Is it a blessed day? Are you happy that you were able to get your feet out of the bed? Are you happy with the fact that you had a bed to get out of? And, and so that's my mindset, choices. You have a choice that you can be a victim. You have a choice that you can be meek and timid, or you have a choice that you can be confident and believe that you can bring change. And, and, and I'll make it as simple as this. Each day on my way to the gym, I have a choice. Do I go to the gym or do I stop at McDonald's? And I'm not gonna lie, sometimes McDonald's wins, <laughs> but it's a choice and it's, it's that simple. And some people are like, well, it's not that simple. And, and, and I'll give you an example of this. I had a person tell me one, one time, they're like, they, they raised their hand in the audience, we were doing Q&A, and, right. and, and they said, well, um, it, it's, uh, in, my, in where I live, there's not a lot of opportunities. I said, oh, that's easy. And, and they're like, how? I said, one word. And they go, what? I go, move. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and here's the thing, they were a little bit offended. They were like, well, well, it's not that easy. I said, I never said anything was going to be easy. Mm -hmm. I said, the answer is easy. The, some of the hardest decisions and choices you make in life are the most impactful that will lead you to the things that you want in life. And then the last one, mindset, choices, hard work. My God, I, I've got no college degree. I, I still hold a pencil the, the wrong way, whatever that is. Can't tell you an adverb from an adjective. I still struggle. I, I, I'll own it. Uh, it. I struggle when I read my kids' books at, at night to them. Um, but I made a commitment to myself that I'd never let anybody outwork me. And, and notice I didn't say work harder. You know, when, when people are laying uh, landscaping here in, in, in Texas in 103 degrees, they all work harder than me. But when I yeah. said no one would outwork me, that's results driven. The results that I'm after, no, no one's going to, to outwork, re, outwork me. So mindset, choices, and hard work equal success. I love it. I love it. I mean, it's definitely something that we should all put on our walls because it makes so much sense. Uh, last question, but not least, Javon. Tell us a little bit more about your company and how you guys are being a conscious capitalist, uh, a conscious business. And what does conscious capitalism mean to you? I know it's a lot of, it's a lot, but. Uh, no, no, no. I'll, I'll give you, so I'll tell you about the company. So uh, Scribe Media. And so we're a publishing company. We help authors write, publish, and market their books. Uh, some of the big names we've worked with, you can see the book behind me, uh, the biggest one we've done. Uh, one of the biggest books uh, to, to be published, biggest memoirs ever, uh, David Goggins, Can't Hurt Me. So we, we published his book, but we've also worked with the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, Nassim Taleb, Tiffany Haddish, uh, one of my favorite, Janice Bryant Howroyd. A lot of people don't know this. Um, Janice Bryant Howroyd is the first black woman in America to own a billion dollar company. Most people think it's Oprah and it's not. Yes. 
Yes. Janice Bryan Howroy. Mm-hmm. And so that was one of my favorite books to, to, to work on. Mm-hmm. Um, but the majority of our authors, we've worked with over 1900 authors. The more, majority of them are CEOs, executives, coaches, uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, um, had a lot of uh, success as a company. Entrepreneur Magazine named us the number one company culture in America a couple of years ago. Congratulations. Uh, yeah. So we, we, we've had a lot of uh, success there. Conscious capitalism for me, what does that mean? Um, because we have to be a, a transparent and tell people we both, both of us are on the both board. Both of us, together. yes. Mm-hmm. Both of us are on the board of conscious capitalism. And, and, and every, everybody, I, I believe, many of the, the conscious capitalism, uh, conscious capitalist members uh, have different views and, and different beliefs on what, that, what the definition is for them. Right. Me personally, uh, the, the conscious capitalism for me is I truly believe that we can change the uh, economic landscape of the lower economic communities by way of conscious capitalism. And, and let me d- just, my God, let me go on a rant for, for, Please for 30, go. 30 seconds. Please. In our country right now, we've made things really political. You had people pissed off because they gave corporate tax breaks. You got p- people pissed off because now they want to pull those tax breaks back. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. Here's, for me, conscious capitalism. It's a damn shame in this country that in the lower economic communities, we can tell you what a food desert is, but we can't tell you what organic food is. So, so for me, what I would like to see if, from corporate America and from uh, uh, the political side is let's give tax breaks to those companies who are willing to invest in the lower economic communities. And, and, and I'll, I'll pick on an example here. If Whole Foods set up a, a store in a lower economic community, we all know it's probably not going to be as profitable as the store out by my house at the gated community. Great. Okay, I get it. Yeah. But let's give Whole Foods some massive tax breaks for setting up a store down here. Because here's what's going to happen. Now they at least have a store to go to. They understand what organic food is. Now we've created job opportunities for people. And here's the, what the part that people don't see. You are going to start to break generational poverty. Because if this child can see that his parents go to work each day, that shows that child, oh, okay, you go to work. All right, I got benefits. Oh, they help you go to school. You know, you, you show structure, you show routine, you show possibility. You know, I can't become what I don't even know is possible. So you set up a Starbucks. Again, may not be as profitable, but you know what? You give them massive tax incentives for going down to those communities and setting up. To, to break that generational uh, poverty. And then the last piece on this, I said this the other day, uh, we're, we're working on my second book, it's called uh, Modern Leader. And I said this out loud and we, we caught it. And, I, and man, this really spoke to me and I'm the one who said it. Um, <laughs> that might and, be good actually. Right? Well, well good. Here, here was the thing, it, it's, it's interesting. So let's say you put a Tesla factory in a lower economic community. Let's say you, you know, 3M put a, a, a factory or a plant in a lower economic community. Uh, I, I made the comment, I said, you know what happens then? Now the lower economic communities have jobs, they have opportunities, they have benefits, they're able to to, to break this generational poverty. I said, but now we're not making an argument about being made in America. Now we're making an argument about being made in all of America. Mm, mm. I I, I, I love it. I I, I love it. Um, Talking of books, by the way, Modern Leader is the one coming up. Remind everyone the name, the title of the first one. The first book is called I Got There, How a Mixed Race Kid Overcame Racism, Poverty, and Abuse to Achieve the American Dream, which I damn sure believe the American dream is still alive. It's still well. It's still achievable. It, yeah, do you have to work for it? You always have. No, nothing changed. It, you still have to work for that American dream, but it is still possible. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Well, we're coming to the end of this, Javon. Uh, it's been, um, I knew I would get uh, my fix talking to you today. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I just knew it. Thank you so much. And um, I do hope that we can, uh, you don't, I know you're going to say yes. And don't worry, we're gonna, not going to bother you, though. But um, I do hope that you won't be a stranger 
on this um, on this show because oh for sure I know you'll you have a lot to say about a lot of things. There's so many so many more things I want to talk to you about. One of them has to do with currently the um, the fact that it seems like um, black unemployment rate is going is going up when most everyone else is going down. What's going on with that? And um, so I, I just I just think it's great to have a perspective of someone like you in times like this about these issues. Uh, because someone has to keep us accountable. We cannot all go for the route of uh, let's feel sorry for ourselves and there's nowhere to go. And, you know, we're just going to wait it out, right? Yep. Wish, hope, those three things you said, wish, hope, and the other one. So, Javon, any last parting word for us? It can be anything. Um, you know, we're in, in the society that we live in right now, you, you made the, the comment, uh, you know, Black unemployment. Uh, the, the big thing for me right now is Yes, the country has its flaws. Yes, we we have a, 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 an, an ugly past. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I tell people this: I wasn't even legally allowed to be born in this country until 1967. Mixed race marriage was not allowed until 1967. So, yeah, we we have a harsh past. We have a very fractured past. We have an ugly past. Mm. But for all of our flaws, and every country has them. Every country has them. I still believe is it's the greatest country in the world. It's still a country where you can create an opportunity for yourself. And, you know, I, I, but here's my last piece. I've heard so many people say, well, it's not fair that I had to work 10 times harder than such and such to, to get to, to my position in life. The way I've always looked at that is if I got to work 100 times harder than this person, then I'm just a hundred times better than that person, but I'm going to make damn sure I'm going to succeed by any means necessary. I, I tell people I'm a flood of water. And like, what do you mean by that? I said, water waits for no one. It will go over, through, around, or under, but it's coming. And I said, that's the way that I, I've treated my life. This isn't a dress rehearsal. I get one life. It's for me to make the most of. So I'm coming like a flood of water and I don't give a damn, be it racism, poverty, abuse, nothing is going to stop my flood. And I just want to jump and be like, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> so true. <laughs> it is so true. Javon, on that wonderful note, um, thank you so much. Um, keep going. I am, um, and soon we'll we'll be, you know, we'll get together in person here in Austin. But um, I, I just love everything about you. I love everything that you represent, and I'm so so um, so grateful to God that uh, you're on this journey with us. So um, thank you, Javon. I um, I just. Just thank you. My God, I appreciate it. You know that I, I say this with all sincerity because I don't say it to everyone. You text me, call me, email me, send me smoke signals. You know I'm there. I know you are. Thank you so much. Thank I, you, ma'am. Really, thank you. Bye, Javon. Thank Bye. You so much. Thank you.